Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely and this is Question and Answer Time. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Hey everybody, before we start this q and I just wanted to mention that I'm not gonna be able to talk about my last video, the Universal Music Group video, where I complained that they were making it very difficult for me as a music educator to teach on YouTube because of copyright blocks, because I filmed that video at the same time as this current Q&A, so I won't be able to talk about it. But I did wanna mention one thing. So as soon as I uploaded my video, I immediately got not a copyright strike, but a not suitable for all advertisers strike, which means that the algorithm found something in my video that it deemed to be offensive or not suitable for all advertisers. And this was a little bit confusing because normally I can point to something that a dumb context-free algorithm might find issue with, like a swear word, for example. But I censored all my swear words and I didn't get a copyright strike for my Evanescence clip, so I was a little bit confused. I thought for a second and thought, well, maybe it's the phrase Universal Music Group in the title itself. Turns out I was completely right. As soon as I removed Universal Music Group from the title, the strike went away. Now it's tempting to think that Universal Music Group is specifically suppressing discussion about Universal Music Group on YouTube, but more likely YouTube is basically suppressing any sort of trademark name in the title or in the description or anything because it's deemed not suitable for all advertisers. The search engine optimization for trademark names is something that's very, very dear to them. I put Universal Music Group back in the title because I wanted a manual review to make sure that when you search Universal Music Group on YouTube right now, my video is the first thing that comes up. So I encourage you, whenever you search Universal Music Group on YouTube, to click my video and also on Google to make sure that the search engine optimization optimization leads it away from their particular control of their trademark to discussion of their trademark. Anyway, that's my piece. Let's get to the regular Q&A. Jesse Hampsch writes, I'm a composer and it seems like my most successful pieces in terms of feedback are the ones I have to turn around in a few days. Pieces I work on for weeks or even months never seem to do as well. Do you think this has more to do with the process of composition or the commercial value of music that is written for accessibility? Thanks. So yeah, there's nothing quite like a deadline to really get the creative juices flowing because a deadline forces you to really think about the creative decision making that you would normally do if you didn't have a deadline. For example, if you're thinking constantly about should an oboe play this melody or should a flute play this melody? Or maybe should I EQ the snare at like 5 dB boost at one kilohertz or two kilohertz? These are decisions that need to be made quickly if you have a deadline because otherwise you're gonna eat up all your time and there's going to be real world consequences to dawdling on this decision making process. Your career will take a hit or you'll lose out on money. Having a deadline forces you to think in broader strokes rather than getting bogged down in details. If you have months and months to work on a project, you're gonna to start second guessing decisions that you made months ago. And then you're gonna start cannibalizing the piece of music for no particular reason. Attention to detail is a must, don't get me wrong, but second guessing your decisions, especially on things which ultimately don't matter a whole lot, is going to be the death of the creative process. And lest you think that I am just making this up and I'm not speaking from personal experience, this video and this YouTube channel is a perfect example of what I'm talking about because for the past two and a half years, I've released a video every Monday. That Monday deadline has forced me to really think about big picture stuff in order for me to get out a video for everybody to watch. Now, it also seems to me that you're talking about the relative complexity of the music that you are releasing, because you mentioned accessibility. One thing that I see that happens all the time, and honestly in my past I've been guilty of feeling this way too, people who write complex music, they generally tend to feel like they're owed adulation from people. They're owed adulation from the general public because they wrote something that they feel is incredibly complex and worthy of admiration just because of how much time it took to put together. I see this sort of thing all the time, and I'm not saying that this is what you're doing, but when you're talking about music in terms of accessibility and supposed non-accessibility, that I can't help but think along these lines. Jason Blassingame writes, Hey Adam, my question relates to the concept of modal interchange. I'm interested to know if diatonic function tension and release has any bearing to which modal interchange chords are used in relationship to the original chords in a piece. Peace, love, and bass. Yeah, of course. Whenever you're talking about harmony, tension and release is kind of the main thing. It's the engine which drives harmony forward. And it's definitely the same thing with modal interchange harmony. When you have modal interchange, what you're doing is borrowing chords from the parallel minor of a given major key so that you can create a new form of tension and release. The way that we can think about this tension and release is in terms of the scale degrees which change from the major key to the minor key. In this case, the flat three, the flat 
six and the flat seven. If we look at how these scale degrees work melodically, we can glean some important information. The thinking goes is that if you have a scale degree that is a half step away from another scale degree, it will have a tension resolution pattern to the note which is a half step away. For example, in a major key, the natural resolution pattern of the natural seven is to resolve up to the root. In a minor key, we have two options. We got the flat six that might resolve down to the five, and then we have the flat three which might resolve down to the two. But we don't normally think about the flat three as having tension which needs to be resolved because the flat three is part of the tonic triad. This leaves the flat six as the main engine of melodic tension and release for the minor scale. And because it's the main melodic engine, it's also the main harmonic engine as well. So any chord which has the flat six of a parallel minor key to a major scale will be a good candidate for modal interchange. This includes chords like the four minor or the flat six major. These are the chords that you find most often used in modal interchange, especially the four minor, and that flat six is the reason why, because of that tension resolution pattern of the flat six resolving down to the five. Sword of Phoenix writes, how is social skill important in a musician's career? I mean, I've said this a bunch of times before on this channel, but I think just the ability to have a conversation with somebody and knowing how to interact with somebody on a professional level is extremely important because when you're a musician, you are a business unto yourself in so many ways. It's not just like, oh, I get to sit in my room and play bass all the time. That's not being a musician professionally. It goes a little bit beyond that. You have to expand your network and meet people and interact with them, request favors from them, and be flexible enough to do favors for them. There's so many different sorts of social interactions that you need to be prepared for if you're going to be a musician. If you're in a band, especially a touring band, that's spending all of their time together, you're going to need the emotional intelligence to know when to back off and give people their space, and also know what your limits are in that sort of situation. So being Socially aware and also socially adept is extremely important to having a successful career, I think. L2112 lifts writes, couldn't I just play the lick over the changes and survive any jam session? That's a totally feasible plan of attack and I strongly suggest that you do that. Michael Bixel writes, hi, you say you never listen to music in a passive way. I'm actually listening to jazz while writing this comment. What's wrong with that? How do you listen to jazz? How should we practically listen to jazz? Smiley face. So in my last Q&A, I did say that I don't listen to music in a passive way with like music on in the background. And I, people took that to mean you shouldn't do that. That's something that a person should not do. And I was just talking about that from my own personal experience as a musician who surrounds himself with music constantly. So for me personally, I can't do that because when music is on in the background, it becomes background noise and then I get more and more jaded to music in general and I don't wanna do that. Nothing is wrong with you if you do that. In fact, a lot of music is designed for that and a lot of music is designed with that in mind. But for me, again, me personally, I cannot listen to music passively. Now in terms of your second question, how to listen to jazz, that's a great question. I'm gonna try and answer it as succinctly as possible. But there's a couple things that you should know as a matter of music appreciation about how jazz is structured, at least in the traditional sense, music from the hard bop tradition, which mainly comes from the 1950s and 1960s, and is kind of considered the gold standard for how jazz is organized today. Generally speaking, you'll have a small combo of musicians, usually a drummer, a pianist, a bass player, and maybe a couple horn players. The ensemble will first start out by playing a simple melody, it will usually be about 30 seconds to a minute in length, and following that, every member of the band will take turns improvising their version of this melody, so there will be the sax solo version of the melody, and then there will be the piano solo, and then, God forbid, there might be a bass solo version of that. And at the end of it all, they'll go back and they'll play the melody in its original form, and then the tune will be done. This melody, by the way, is sometimes called the head, and sometimes you'll see jazz musicians go like this, referencing their head to say, hey, we should go back and play the melody again. When each member of the band is improvising their version of the head, they're working in pretty strict harmonic guidelines. So whenever you're listening to somebody solo, try and listen to how the chord progression works within that solo, and then try and match that chord progression to what you heard at the beginning of the song. It can sometimes be very difficult to understand what is going on during the solo improvisations, but if you pay very close attention to what the piano player and the bass player are doing during these and match the harmony to what you heard at the beginning, the whole thing starts to make a lot more sense and starts to click a lot more. All of a sudden, you'll really get inside the head of the jazz improvisers 
and understand what they're trying to think of and trying to communicate within the harmony to you, the audience. That is my like super abridged version of how to listen to jazz for complete beginners. There's so many other things I could mention, but that is kind of at the core of it. What you wanna try and do is figure out what a person is thinking about while they're creating the music. What are they trying to communicate? And without knowing this sort of relationship of the head melody to the improvisation, to the harmony, to the relationships of all the different members of the ensemble, it could be difficult to have the necessary context in order to understand what the jazz is, quote, about. This context, I think, is really important. The context of how music was created, because it makes you a little bit more of an active participant in the listening process. Actively listening to something, trying to really hear what somebody was trying to go for when they created a particular sound is important in music. And that's one of the things that makes music so exciting for me. Being a passive listener, not as much. But being an active listener, hell yeah. Cup of tea, right? People in the comments actually think you haven't heard the song before. You didn't see he hasn't heard it, he said he doesn't know it, meaning he hasn't learned to play it. So one of my older videos is all about writing down everything that you hear to access musical memory. Basically getting in the habit of transcribing in detail things that you learn so that you never have to relearn it again in the future. And that's a very useful practical skill for a performing musician. In that video, I do kind of a live transcription of Just Like Heaven by The Cure, where I basically listen to it for the first time and then I show the process of me writing the whole thing out. And a lot of people had a lot of trouble believing that I was doing that legitimately for the first time, never having heard the song before in the past. I do transcription live streams occasionally for my patrons where I will be transcribing songs for a gig that I might have that weekend. That's just what it is. Having a strong ear and being able to do an efficient workflow is just part of the whole process. You know, I'm not alone in this, like all of my peers and all of my contemporaries who are working musicians here can do it just as fast, if not way faster than I can. That's just kind of a skill that's necessary. How do you develop the skill? Well, watch the video to find out, and also a lot of practice. AL underscore 2017 writes, you get a ghetto wedding gig, it pays 120 each, you get a band of guys you know, guys that like to play jazz, but they didn't necessarily win the Thelonious Monk jazz competition. They agree to come to one rehearsal, then the groom has picked five songs he wants, mostly songs that Sinatra sang, the other six songs you can pick, so you're gonna make the band transcribe a bunch of Sinatra? And what about the other tunes? Come on, easy arrangements make the world go round for most functional working musicians. Uh, what you just described, even though it's commonplace all around the world for working musicians, sounds like utter hell. You know, I didn't become a musician to become a mediocre musician and just half-ass my job. I wanted to be the best musician I could be. And just half-assing your job is not something to take pride in. I want to have pride in what I do. I feel like no matter what you do, you want to have pride, but uh, half-assing a wedding gig sounds terrible. If I was actually put in that situation and I wouldn't take the gig in the first place, but if I had to do the gig, what I would do is I would take a larger cut of that money and be an MD or band director, and I would write out all the charts and transcribe it and give it to everybody. I also wouldn't have a rehearsal because I know my ability to write a chart is good, and I would also hire people who I knew could throw down in that situation. So what you have is then you just have 11 songs that people come and they read down, they get the music a week ahead of time, and you have a much much better product for less work and less stress. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, half-assing these gigs, man, I know it's commonplace all around the world, but uh, it just, it bums me out. It really does. Noah S writes, Hey, just wondering, does anyone know of any educational style YouTubers similar to Adam Neely? I love looking at how different professionals have different takes on all kinds of different ideas like this. Preferably having somebody like this for saxophone specifics would mean a lot to me. However, any instrument would be fine as so much of this is cross instrumental. Thanks for anyone who takes the time to respond. So as a saxophone player, I would definitely check out Bob Reynolds first and foremost. Not really exactly like what I do here on this channel, but he is definitely somebody who has embraced the YouTube and vlogging platform. And you can learn a lot from him because he is an incredibly accomplished LA-based sax player. He plays in Snarky Puppy, he has his own band, and it's a great sort of insight into what it means to be a musician just in a different city and on a different instrument than you know my channel. But just understand when you have this sort of comment, like, can you recommend somebody who's like Adam Neely but not Adam Neely? It can sound a little like insulting almost. I know it's not meant insulting, but I get this comment so frequently. Can it be Adam Neely for guitar? Adam Neely for drums? I mean, I think it speaks to a deep need of a lot of people to have somebody 
to can connect with them for their particular instrument. And I think there's a, a void which almost needs to be filled for a lot of different instruments. So if you are a teacher, a music teacher, I strongly suggest that you start doing vlog type videos because there's a lot of people who want to connect with you and connect with this particular platform and you know feel they have that sort of way of educating themselves and way of getting excited about music. So I think there's a great opportunity there if you are a teacher, go out and start your YouTube channel because I think there are people who will watch it. Golden K Music writes, Dear Adam, I'm trying to get a girlfriend. Are there any bass techniques that will help me get one? I'm very lonely. Golden K Music. So this is what I've learned in the past decade or so of trying to balance my life as a professional musician with having a love life. Women like when... Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Question and Answer Time with Adam Neely. If you're listening to this as a podcast on iTunes, be sure to remember to rate and review. Please comment, like, and subscribe. And also consider joining my Patreon because it's the patrons over at my Patreon that make this channel possible. So thank you so much. And until next time, peace.